crazy stories once again we are in 1693 with a king who is going to lose his temper this king is william III of england he is absolutely mad at the brand privateers attack the english navy he can't take it anymore and he will decide to attack the main french hideout which is the city of saint malo except that the city was fortified by bourbon it is almost impregnable the british at that time will put in place an infernal machine that you cannot imagine. Something completely crazy. I'm not hiding anything from you. It's going to go very badly. But to understand all this a little, we must put ourselves back in the context of the times. I remind you, it is 1693. Since 1688, the France of Louis XIV has been at bitter war against a broad European coalition called the Augsburg League. The latter is made up, among others, of England, the United Provinces, the Netherlands of the Germanic Empire, Spain, Portugal, and Sweden. Basically, it was really the zone where everyone was getting upset at the time. The good old days. In short, the clashes of these powers usually takes place off the coast of Spain, between Cape St. Vincent and the Azores, or in the Mediterranean. Since England decided, in the middle of the century, to dispute maritime supremacy with Holland, the fighting, however, moved towards the north directly attacking these two great powers. In 1688, France saw the location of the clashes come considerably closer to its coasts. Before the fighting, it was far to the east, and now it's starting to come a little closer to the coast. Each can easily observe the other and quickly harm them. The enemy, of which France distrusted the most in several decades, has changed nationality. It's no longer Spain, but it's now England. Obviously, as you know, only the Channel Sea separates France from England. It's not much sea that the English probably have a little too much tendency to be considered English, particularly to the taste of the French. We argue a little about territories, even the seas. The threat will appear along the coasts of Brittany, Normandy, and Picardy. Each Channel port must adapt to this new situation. And yes, since now the enemy, he is in front of the fleet to reduce the situation to the greatest possible simplicity. This is what will inevitably strengthen the ribs, the cities that secure the coast because they can arrive from here. Moreover, in 1692, France suffered a bitter failure during the naval battle de la Hague, battle in Normandy, and Louis XIV, fine strategist, decides to play it differently. Proper battles are quickly put on the shelf, and France will bet on something else. It will bet on privateers. So, what are privateers for those who don't know? Bok. These corsairs who are sent by France, we send them out to sea, and they will attack merchant convoys in a half. Corsairs are civilians mandated by the king or the state. They fight against merchant ships under foreign flag with a status equivalent to the military, but without being attached to a staff of the Royal Navy. It's a bit like militias, but here they are. They are recognized, but not completely validated. It's a bit freestyle. Pirates and privateers. The privateers respect the life of the crew, and that is very personal. Only the vessel and its cargo are subject to seizure after each seizure. An investigation is established to see if the taking is legitimate and the property is returned. Otherwise, there really is a code of honor. Privateers very rarely attack warships and suffer little of human losses between 1692 and 1763. It is estimated that only 0.6% crews of privateer ships died in combat. Privateers cannot be confused with pirates. That, it is important to distinguish between privateers. They're not pirates. They're really the opposite. They will carry out their activity only in times of war, with authorization of their government. And when they are captured, they are entitled to prisoner of war status. This type of naval warfare is called coarse warfare. The aim of this maneuver is to suffocate the opposing economy by avoiding its military fleet, which attacks commercial ships. This way, they reduce financial flows. The country is weakening and doing well. René Duguet-Troy and Robert Surcouf are well-known corsairs from St. Molo. Obviously to name just a few, there are others. The privateers wage war for commercial purposes, entering into a contract called hunting party a few days before departure, with information on the destination and purpose of the shipment. It is necessary to have received a letter of mark as it is called, or letters of commission from the king to attack enemy ships. This authorization ends with the end of the conflict. The winning crew is sent to the seized ship with the mission to bring it back to port to resell the boat and its cargo, but also disembark the prisoners and offer to the ship's owner seize the release of his crew for ransom. The Corsairs are obliged to respect the lives of the prisoners. They don't do what they want. They're not pirates, but they must also respect the personal effects of enemy sailors, because none of that is part of the loot. Seals are placed on the prisoners' chests and trunks. Only the vessel and its cargo may be subject to seizure, provided that it is deemed legitimate by the competent authorities. When they returned from the race, they were really taking that what transported professionally, that is, 
If he was carrying gold coins in the hold, which was considered the main cargo, they could take it, but not the biftons or whatever that the guy had in his trunk, and which was his. It's a bit like the tax office of the seas. We'll say, enemy sailors are considered prisoners of war. They can be released or exchanged for ransom at the end of hostilities. And indeed, this technique will work very well. England is getting hit on the head with a club from a financial point of view from getting screwed its commercial ships and being robbed. So much so that it will cause financial disaster in London and it will force King William III to react. At the end of his nerves, the British sovereign wants to head hard and organizes the assault on the lair of French Corsairs, the town of St. Malo, except that Louis XIV is smart. He was always one step ahead. He had actually planned it a bit. He ordered Vauban, his greatest military architect, to strengthen the defenses of St. Malo in case no all the fortifications of Vauban. There are a lot of cities, Castles in St. Molo, but there are plenty of them in Carcassonne, etc. To quickly remind you who Vauban is. To understand a little who is this gentleman, he is a genius of architecture, particularly reinforcements, rather fortifications. Sebastian Le Preste de Vauban, his full name, has designed and produced fortresses for many cities in France. In total, it is estimated that he would have worked on around 160 fortified sites during his career as a military engineer. These fortifications were designed to consolidate the defense of the Kingdom of France under the reign of Louis XIV, and they also played an important role in the security and military power of France at the time. Vauban's fortifications are recognized for their ingenuity and their formidable efficiency. Vauban will therefore modify St. Malo not only the Cidre walls and the castle to place artillery there, but he also draws plans of forts positioned on the main islands in the bay. With such a genius at his service, St. Molo is impregnable and William III knows it. So, if he cannot take St. Molo, he will destroy it. The Infernal Machine. William III will not waste time and in the greatest secrecy, he's going to put something in place. He orders a few hand-picked workers to build what is called an Infernal Machine, a machine capable of reducing St. Molo to dust. His fine team sets about the task, out of sight more precisely in the Tower of London. Design of the Infernal Machine, which will take two years. It is a huge ship with a black sail measuring 26 meters long. The English are literally building a 300 tons bomb which had never been seen before in all of human history. I don't know if you surrender realize the mess they are making. It's a big delusion. At the base of the Infernal Machine is a layer of sand aimed at absorbing all the moisture and adding ballast. There are hard crushed stones there like on the railways. The sand is then covered with masonry on which rests a load of more than 100 barrels of gunpowder, therefore black powder extremely explosive. The next level contains six carcasses and iron chests filled with grenades, cannonballs, iron chains, loaded firearms. When the ship has to explode, all this material is designed to be propelled into the air and to land on the houses of St. Molo or on other ships around causing giant fires and massive destruction. Grenades and charged guns explode or fire randomly which dissuades the French from fighting fires caused by the wooden carcasses of the ship. The next level is made up of 50 barrels filled with projectiles and fireworks like missiles. It's called a missile, but it's destroyed. He was armored to the brim with explosives and stuff. We see them in every direction. 300 tons, 300 kilos of explosives, counting the boat, that's a little less. But it was enough to literally blow up a city. On the deck of the infernal machine, there is a stack of loaded cannons, filled with gunpowder and bullets, ready to explode as additional security measures. If the cannons were to fall intact into the hands of the enemy, they were rendered useless by dropping their carriages. Basically, they had made sure to break down the cannons so that we cannot use them. If they were recovered without the trunnions as they are called, barrels could not be mounted on a gun carriage. In addition to the cannons, there are mortars loaded with melted shells ready to explode. The guys had gone crazy. I don't know if you realize. William, the King of England, he said okay. We're going to make a large boat filled with explosives. We are going to send it to St. Molo. Shut up. Shut up. But then, how do we trigger the explosion of a such a ship since at the time, obviously, there was no remote stuff. Here several holes are drilled on the upper deck up to the barrels which are located below. And a quick match is used. A member of the crew must light the matches, rush off the ship to a waiting boat, then row quickly to get away from the ship while exploding. To summarize, it is the equivalent of when you light a firecracker and you run away. Except there are 300 tons of explosives there. This means that if the fuse goes too fast, it's over for you and your friends. Be careful, because the idea is to send the boat all alone towards St. Malo. There's no one on it, otherwise he dies. And so the wick must burn at a known speed. Sometimes it's a little more complicated. Additional details. The vessel is designed to navigate in shallow waters, which will allow it to get as close as possible to the coasts of St. Malo. Moreover, 
The most paradoxical thing is that its inventor is a French Huguenot, as we call this guy called Fournier. So, the term Huguenot is a derivative of German and Gehenno, excuse me for the pronunciation which means Confederates, and which was initially used pejoratively to refer to French Protestants. The Huguenots played a significant role in religious history and politics of France. At that time, they were often persecuted because of their religious beliefs. Many of them found refuge in England, Germany, the Netherlands, and the United States. The guy who makes this machine is a French man who left living in England, whose name is Fournier, a military engineer. But in fact, it is the English naval engineer Thomas Phillips which brings Fournier's drawn plans to life. And the objective is obviously, it is very simple to send the ship on the wasp's nest, which was the nickname given to St. Malo by the English and wipe the city off the map. The goal was really to atomize St. Malo, the plan. It is well put together, and obviously the machine like that, on paper, it looks formidable. Everything will work as planned or almost the day of the Great Raid. It is November 13, 1693, and the day of the Great Raid has arrived. An imposing fleet comprising 12 warships, 12 brigantine and 4 bombships equipped with motors for bombardment, as well as the infernal machine set sail towards St. Molo, and all that under the command of the courageous Captain John Benbow Benbow Dembo Benbow. He supervised the design of this machine for two years. He wasn't alone in that he was extremely impatient to see what she would be able to give. By 12 p.m. on November 16, most of the English fleet headed towards St. Molo, taking advantage of a strong wind coming from the north, despite rough seas and a powerful tide for hours. Royal Navy crews battled difficult and treacherous waters in particular to position their ships for the bombardment. It wasn't until 10 p.m. that they finally threw from 10 p.m. until 4 a.m. the fleet shells St. Molo, throwing a whole bunch of shells and mortars over the ramparts with the ebbing tide. The fleet is suddenly forced to leave the bay for fear of running aground on the sandbanks surrounding St. Molo. The bombing pattern continued over the next two days. Bombships fire hundreds of projectiles, including bombs, towards the city. Obviously, after a while, he starts to run out of ammo, to throw in St. Molo to make it burn. And this is where the infernal machine will intervene. The infernal machine is therefore called to enter the stage on the evening of November 19, as part of a diversionary ploy. The fleet sends a landing party to overwhelm a small garrison and burn a convent on a neighboring island. In fact, this flamboyant spectacle, if you allow me the expression, is good. This provides a diversion for the arrival of the infernal machine, because this boat is still very strange, notably because of its black sails which are deployed and which are uncommon, and he disappears into the darkness. On board the infernal machine, there is engineer Phillips, and a minimal crew supports the navigation of the vessel through the numerous rocks but also the shallows dotting the approach to the walls of the ancient citadel of St. Molo. Built in stone and reinforced by Valban in the dark night, the infernal machine approaches its final destination without a sound. However, by the time the ship is almost in position, the wind suddenly begins to turn, throwing him against a rock. Despite several attempts to free the ship from this unfortunate situation, all efforts prove to be in vain. He actually has Phillips who understands that the situation is turning sour. The boat is taking on water, and obviously, Wet gunpowder doesn't work anymore, and so he will make a decision. He will light the boat before. He will trigger what we call the fuses, and he and his crew flee. And from there, everything will literally go wrong. The ship rises in a deafening explosion which shakes St. Molo like an earthquake. Even with the distance, the explosion will make St. Molo tremble because it was so charged that the shockwave will reach St. Molo. The roofs of the houses are torn off. The protective sea wall of the citadel collapses. The wings of the windmills are torn off also and the explosion shatters all the glass in the windows. The blast explodes, the porcelain and the terracotta for kilometers around. Projectiles rain down from all sides. Hundreds of bombs and grenades explode relentlessly with a domino effect, throwing the population into panic. Burning wooden carcasses fall from the sky in all directions, and miraculously, part of the ship survives, probably thanks to the gunpowder wet barrel present in this section. And Jean, writer of the time, will tell of the luminous whirlwind of bad luck terrifying the darkness, the air burns, the sea boils, the earth trembles with a roar, the ship disintegrates, planks and beams spin, the mast dragging behind it the shrouds in flames, blazing, new comet. He spoke like that at the time, but you roughly understand what the fireworks of the year were. The damage caused is only material. St. Molo suffered damage, but remained intact. Legend has it that this failure broke Thomas Hart, Phillips who, so unfortunate, fell ill and died three days later. At the same time, the guy who spent two years of his life working non-stop on this 
and it totally screws up. The wind ruined everything. The only victim listed by the French is a cat that died after receiving an ember on its tail. And besides, in Saint Molo, there is a street that we will call Rue du Chat Key Dance. It takes its name from this unfortunate feline, obviously like a big face. Towards the English and elsewhere, there were obviously songs and even proverbs that say English which, like the mountain, are not one poor rat in his Saint Molo countryside only killed a poor cat. Except that from this moment on, the French will still freak out a little to know that the English are capable to build huge bomb boats because that attempt failed. But who says it won't work next time? Captain Bembo is not done with the infernal machines because two others are ready and a new attack is launched, this time against Dieppe. However, the French adapt by blocking the port with sunken ships and infernal machines have little effect. When the war ended in 1697, the infernal machines are completely abandoned. It will be over 100 years before another infernal machine is used in an attempt to destroy a pirate lair. But basically, we're going to completely abandon the idea because hey, it works once in 100 and still it costs too much. It takes too long to do. But in any case, it's completely incredible. I hope you enjoyed it. I leave you with this video. Thanks everyone. It happened so far. Thank you for all your comments. I ask you if you want to subscribe. I kiss you obviously. I'll tell you next time it was to serve you. Kisses to all. Thanks again friends.